Okay, um, thank you all for joining. We are just about to, we're just starting right now. Um, so I'd like to start by welcoming you to the report launch for the Fair Work Gender and Platform Work Report. Uh, so this report's authored by me, Dr. Anjali Krishan, and my co-author, Kavita Dittani, as well as Georgina Lubka, Julia Varaskin, and Professor Mark Rahim, the Director and Principal Investigator of Fair Work. Kavita will be handling the moderation this afternoon. As most of you know, Fair Work is an action research project that's been operational since 2019. It produces annual country-specific scorecards that rate platforms on the basis of five principles, fair pay, fair conditions, fair contracts, fair management, and fair representation. The project aims to improve working conditions for all um, uh, working conditions for those within the platform economy. I hope you all can hear me. Yeah, okay, great. <laughs> I should have asked that before. Um, okay, so this report specifically looks at a subset of workers, that of women and gender minorities and how the platform economy treats them. It argues that commonplace practices within the platform economy, such as the failure of most platforms to pay a living wage after costs, guarantee entitlements such as health insurance or parental leave, and as well as ignoring entrenched gender discrimination, all work to further marginalize women and gender minorities. So before we go into the keynote speeches, um, just a little housekeeping. So we are fortunate to have a large and varied audience with a wide range of views, and we request that everyone's opinions and perspectives are respected in the space. For your awareness, this event is being recorded and will be posted on our website following the event. Please pose any questions using the Q&A tab at any time. This will be answered in our Q&A session at the end of the event. Please keep questions as concise as possible. Questions will be visible to all attendees and can be upvoted and commented upon, and we will endeavor to follow up any unanswered queries. Please do mention your name and organizations within the questions. Thank you. And now, um, please join me in... Uh, Please join me in welcoming our first keynote speaker speech by Dr. Uma Rani. Dr. Uma Rani is a senior economist at the Research Department of the International Labor Office. Dr. Rani's work on gender and digitalization is both groundbreaking and a crucial resource for us here at Fair Work. And I, for one, am really looking forward to her keynote. So Dr. Rani, please. Yes, thank you so much, Anjali, for having me and Anjali and team, Kavita and other colleagues. It's a real pleasure to be part of this fair work uh, launch of the gender report. I always wondered why is it that fair work has not really gone into looking at gender issues. And I was thrilled to see uh, this report coming out. And there's a lot more uh, to hear from colleagues there. But what I thought of talking to you today is uh, looking at gender in the digital economy and touching upon two aspects or two issues that I would say, that is that of the numbers which are often rolling around in the policymaking circle and also the question around access. So, I think we all know, and uh, the ILO produced a report in 2021, which very clearly showed how the digital labor platforms had been growing and how um, it is penetrating across uh, different sectors of the economy. And how with the COVID-19 pandemic, this penetration has further accelerated actually. Now, I think what is very interesting within this entire phenomena of platforms is how it is being increasingly embraced by the governments. And I think a lot of it is around the hope that it will generate jobs, and uh, especially for young people and for women. 
and women as a subsector is something that is very much highlighted by them, irrespective of the part of the world that they are actually engaging in. And I think that's also one of the reasons why it is, becomes very important for us to look at that. So given this push towards the platformization of work, uh, there is really a clear need for us to have a deeper engagement about what is women's work and what is women's work within the digital economy and to explore what is the role of digitalization and its gendered implications on the lives and livelihoods that are there and to what extent you know it tries to bring about any sort of a social or economic insecurities or securities for women and especially when you are looking at in the context of the care and household responsibility burdens that they have. So the first issue that I would like to touch upon is around the ongoing debate about the possibilities of digitalization increasing labor force participation rates and for it to provide opportunities for marginalized women and groups to access these labor markets. The question is to what extent this happens and does it really happen? And is it that, you know, having uh, access to a particular platform would translate itself into having any kind of opportunities that women can have or not. Now, a lot of this uh, notion is often based on the fact that you know, pro uh, platforms provide women with the flexibility to balance paid work with household responsibilities. And here, this is where creating employment opportunities comes in, that is the numbers matter. And there's a huge expectation that this is now going to be the new silver bullet to solve the problem of declining female labor force participation rates in many of the Global South countries, and especially in uh, some of the low developed or middle income countries. And this has often led to promotion of platforms in various sectors, irrespective of whether they are male dominated or female dominated sector. But I think what we do know from the evidence is largely, whether you're talking about the global surveys or the country level surveys, you do find that the participation rates are very similar on these platforms, as you would see in the traditional labor market. Now, this is not anything new. This is not very surprising. You do find that if you're looking at online labor platforms, you find that in the developed world, it is about one, four, one third of the women are on platforms, while in the global south, it is one fourth of the women. And if you're looking at male dominated uh, sectors of platforms, you find that, okay, women dominate, women are comprised of about 10%, while female dominated platforms, it's almost 80 versus 20 uh, women and men. Now, there are no surprises here either. Why is it not so surprising? It's largely because platforms have entered sectors that are already there. And what you're doing is you're using technology either to outsource tasks or projects uh, globally through online labor platforms or using technology to facilitate work through those digital applications in location-based platforms. So at the country or national level, when you're looking at location-based platforms, it is possible to see a small increase in participation rates, but not more than that. And this is something we do see happening within the location-based platforms. But in case of online la labor platforms, the situation is slightly different. And what you might see is that there might be a small increase again, as you see in location, but to a very large extent, what might be happening is that one might be replacing women workers from global north by female workers in global south. What do I mean by that? You know, recently there has been a very much rise in AI enabled tools. And one such tool that I have been systematically following for the last four or five years is that of AI enabled virtual assistants for secretarial tasks. Now these are tasks that were done by women in the global north. And now it's said that it's all AI enabled and you know these women are being replaced into other tasks. But in reality, while that is happening, 
all of these tasks are actually done by women workers in the global south. And this is done either by BPO companies or on digital labor platforms, and it works in a human in the loop. And you find so many uh, you know, companies that have come up that provide virtual assistance, but behind this AI is the invisible worker who are actually going about doing this work. Now, the transformation that is happening as a result of this is that these were relatively well-paid tasks in the global north. And that is now today being fragmented into multiple tasks because at the same time, while women workers are doing these tasks, they're also being automated and there are large uh, uh, machine learning models that are being trained on a regular basis. But because the way the natural language processing uh, technology is moving, it's not easy to completely replace it over time by AI. So you need a lot of these uh, workers to do them. So what you see is the fragmentation of tasks and workers being paid on a task basis. So the wages are very low and they're often without proper working conditions. So while the question of participation rates remains quite unresolved, it is also important to look beyond these numbers and some of the dominant narratives of flexibility, independence, autonomy, and entrepreneurship, which is often pushed by the multinationals dominating the platform economy. And the notion that this participation in platforms itself would inevitably lead to improved working conditions for women. This is largely because the narratives mask the working conditions that are commonly characterized by precarity, low and unpredictable pay, long hours, lack of contracts, lack of access to social protection. And what you very clearly see is atomization of work as well as underemployment because there's a huge supply of gig workers, which also further dampens their wages. Now, there is a growing body of evidence that is coming out, which cushions this notion that platforms provide flexibility, and that participation on these platforms will inevitably lead to improved working conditions. Now, what we see from the case studies that have been done across the globe is that there is a very clear narrative of the women, irrespective of the sector, that the reason they do join the platform is motivated by the flexibility and the autonomy that they are pro promised. But very soon, it becomes a myth because the reality is far from that. And the reality is that because women juggle between household uh, and care responsibilities and this paid work, they often work long hours and they often work odd hours during the day. Like in the case of delivery workers in Mexico, we found that women work about six days a week and more than six hours each day to be able to earn some income over a period of time. Rather, what we see is that this flexibility further becomes a tool for legitimizing the double shifts for women. And I think what one needs to also understand within the context, this context of platforms pushing for this idea of flexibility and getting all of this labor into the workforce is that their incomes or their revenues would not go up if they did not employ. It's not only a service that they provide, but it's also a part of the earnings that women earn through, uh, that the platforms earn through the commission fees. So for them, it's really very good to push many of these women into the workforce. So for women, it becomes then a constant struggle between the production and the re social reproduction process, which deepens the vulnerability of women platform workers, and they don't really enjoy the kind of flexibility that is often promoted. And further, what you see very clearly is that the promise of flexibility is also impinged upon by the control that the platform has through the algorithmic management practices. And finally, within this narrative, I think what is very important is how platforms actually misclassify workers as self-employed or independent contract workers, which allows them to circumvent labor laws and regulations, and that helps them to further marginalize women workers. And this lack of access 
and the flexibility that uh, that the platforms provide. They both work actually in favor of the platform as they have a workforce which is 24 seven, which can be exploited without having to provide any work related or social security benefits. Now, one of the reasons why uh, platforms have also tried to promote themselves is they try to argue that they are trying to provide some sort of a gender equality within the labor market. Now, I think what is very important for one to understand is that these th there exists in the traditional labor market gender inequalities, whether you're talking about participation rates, whether you're talking about wages, whether you're talking ed about education in STEM-related sectors. So, you know, the fact that these digital technologies are increasingly seen as a mechanism for socioeconomic development trajectory and for women's economic empowerment, especially in the context of developing countries, needs to be questioned. Because in this context, for them, addressing the gender di digital divide is argued to be critical, as they argue that providing mobile technologies or digital financial services would help one to achieve gender equality as well as sustainable and inclusive economic growth. So here, what comes into picture is access to technologies. Give them the access and the problems will be solved. You would have women's empowerment so that you can advance that agenda as well as actually address the digital divide. But I, th I think the reality is far from it. Now, this is this kind of a narrative, it's not very surprising that this is coming because even the dominant economic discourse actually talks about a similar narrative. It talks about narrowing the digital divide would help in increasing the labor force participation rates and improve the social and economic well-being, which is echoed often by a number of international institutions, whether you're talking about the World Bank or the World Economic Forum, or whether you're talking about UN for Women, or to an extent, even uh, at the ILO, this is an issue that is talked about. But I think pro provision of technology or having a digital infrastructure by itself is not going to solve gender inequalities, cannot solve uh, cannot lead to, uh, you know, there's no automatic way in which gender empowerment would happen. Because I think what is very important for us to ensure is that you need to look beyond the digital inclusion, because there is a whole question around the problems of rights and economic development, which cannot be actually addressed, addressed by this kind of a neoliberal thinking that is there, which is there in the dominant economic discourse, which is there as part of the platform economy that is being pushed, which basically goes about arguing, saying that give them entrepreneurial capacities and abilities, and that itself would ultimately lead to economic uh, women's economic empowerment. I think this notion also rests on the on the this idea also rests on the notion that having sufficient income is enough to be empowered. But I think the kind of societies that we live in is far beyond that. And it is in this notion that even platforms look at economic empowerment in this way. Now, what this entire narrative actually completely ignores is the whole intersectionality that exists between the gendered power relations and the contextual factors that are there. And the contextual factors are very important because that dictates in a way the kind of societies one lives in and the kind of patriarchal norms that exist and social norms that exist in those societies, which can actually limit one to have any kind of and empowerment. So you can talk about having digital access skills or literacy rates, but they cannot automatically transform into empowerment because there are significant barriers that are there to utilize these economic opportunities, which could be because of the kind of race or caste that you belong to or the class or the social inequalities that is there. In a similar vein, I'd like to argue that 
It is very important for us to note that platforms by themselves, because it's a technology, do not automatically eliminate gender inequalities or any sort of an inequality that exists, because it's often based on the assumption that technology is gender neutral. But I think one forgets that the platforms are designed by humans, and even the algorithm within it is designed by humans. So there's very clear biases that are there, which leads to a similar kind of a, uh, which leads to, in a sense, discrimination on the labor on these platforms and gender inequalities. Now, I think there's also very clear, sufficient evidence that we do see that. Uh, because there also exists the notion that with because platforms are gender neutral, you would have women performing almost similar kind of tasks that men are performing. That would happen if you actually address those issues within the traditional labor market. Because this is just a technology mediating, you find gender segregation also happening within the platforms. Like on pre, uh, freelance platforms, you find that women, men dominate tasks related to technology, software development, data analysis. Now this very much mirrors what happens in the traditional labor market. So there's absolutely no difference. So I think to assume that technology itself will solve these problems is a far-fetched notion. And similarly, you see a similar kind of thing happening on earnings, where you have huge disparities in earnings between men and women on platforms. And what's even more interesting is, even when you look at the same gender, that is women, you find huge inequalities between women in Global South and women in Global North where women in Global North almost earn 50% more than that in the Global South women, even if they are doing similar tasks. The question that arises is, why would you have such a dis huge disparity that is there? I'm just closing by just saying that there is also, uh, you know, sectors where, which are male dominated. And when you have women entering those sectors, you find that the algorithmic management practices further penalize these women and ex exasperate their work in income securities, largely because the algorithm is again set with a male dominated setting and not a female dominated setting, which has which disproportionately actually reinforces some of the gender inequalities. I think there is a need to question the whole empowering potential of digital labor platforms on women, particularly those belonging to marginalized groups, as platforms have in fact in many ways entrenched the gender and race-based inequalities and discrimination. So I think it's very important for us to raise some fundamental questions about the future shape and direction of our increasingly globalized and digitalized economies and to see how do you shape and advance on the regulatory aspects to protect the right of all workers, where you look at how the existing uh, inequalities are not reproduced and exasperated, especially along the lines of gender, race, and caste. And I think what's also important for us to note is that while these new technologies are deepening inequalities, it is not technology per se, which is a problem, I think. I think the problem is somewhere else. And I think what we need to do is to have a social dialogue to see how we could use this technology to address some of these interlinked inequalities that are there, and also to ensure that workers, especially women, women workers, could have decent working conditions. And let me stop there. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you, Dr. Rani. Um, that was such a fascinating insight into the complex realities of the gender equality in the platform economy and how the platform economy and the technology that it uses is grounded in a cultural context that has its own inequalities. I would like, I would now like to welcome um, Naomi Bukal, who leads the Digitalization Division of the German Federal Ministry for Economic Cooperation and Development, or BMZ. Um, please uh, st start. Thank you. Yes, hello. Um, good afternoon, uh, dear colleagues and guests. And um, uh, Umar, uh, Dr. Umar, thank you so much for your, for your words. It was so fascinating to uh, listening to you that um, 
I'm not sure that I can um, uh, bring an added value uh, here now, but um, I will do my very best. Um, I'm here today and I welcome you on behalf of the Ministry for Economic Cooperation and Development at the launch of the Fair Work Report, um, Gender and Platform Work. And because of all the reasons that you've just mentioned, I think this is a fascinating topic and I'm very happy to be able to, to discuss this with you today. Fair Work has been a trusted partner whose action research and activities have positively impacted millions of workers worldwide over the course of the last five years. And shedding more light onto the topic of gender and platform work is another big and important step ahead and it comes at a crucial time. Across the globe, digital technologies transform how we learn, work and communicate. And this rapid change constitutes an enormous opportunity. Digital transformation gives us the chance to address many gender related disparities. I mean, you just challenged that. <laughs> you said not the technologies um, per se um, are the problems, um, but the way we use them um, and uh, everything behind it. You talked about intersectionality, about the contextual factors, um, about societal norms, patriarchal norms. But this is why I think it is so important that we discuss today what we can do and how we can address um, these uh, challenges that come also with uh, digital technologies. So how do we make digital transform uh, transformation equitable? Way too often we, we do reproduce old injustices and gender-based roles and expectations. And we do fail uh, to address these inequalities that you also mentioned in labor markets, in representation, access to funding and technologies as well as laws and social uh, norms. So I can only, um, yes, uh, agree with, with what you said. You also mentioned the inequalities between women in, in the global north and the global south. Um, due to such problem, half of the digital talent pool, the female half is partially excluded from contributing to and benefiting from the digital economy as well. So yes, creating framework conditions and promoting international standards that allow women to be fully included and seen. This is our shared goal. Just recently at um, this year's Republica conference, the Federal Minister for Economic Cooperation and Development highlighted the importance of fairness in digital and platform work for women's economic empowerment, because platform work is here to stay. So let's shape it together. She underlined the need to take action to ensure not only equal access to jobs and digital technologies, but also to protect to protection mechanisms that are designed with the needs of female workers at the very core. Because this is what, what really matters, rights, resources, and representation. This 3R approach lies at the heart of the BMZ's feminist development policy. Digital transformation must not only benefit women, it must also be shaped by women. It must leverage their talent, creativity, and their unique perspective. We apply the same high standards to platform economy where women to date find themselves facing discriminatory practices and challenges as the report finds. Just one of the numerous examples, women are not guaranteed safety in traditionally male dominated jobs. And sometimes they are even punished by the platform for flagging a potential threat. So digital platforms tend to side with their clients and not their female workers. Not having clear appeal mechanisms and fearing deactivation, women with voices and stories remain untold. Even when women speak up, their complaints can be ignored by the platform without repercussions. Considering that platform work, as the report clearly outlines, attracts workers who are already in a precarious situation. Such realities can further widen the gender gap and disproportionately affect women. We've already heard that. Because women worldwide still carry the burden of the majority of unpaid labor and thus rely heavily on the flexibility aspect to be able to participate in the labor market. Therefore, to achieve the vision set out by our minister, championing fair and gender sensitive platform work is imperative on all levels. So with our gig economy initiative, we do exactly that. On the one hand, we work directly with workers and undertake various projects to inform them of their rights, build transversal skill sets and empower them to develop fluidly within and beyond the gig economy. 
Let me provide you with some examples. The female mentorship program implemented by Digital Trust Opportunity Kenya has supported 150 mentees in gaining a better understanding of the dynamics of the platform economy. It allowed them to connect with fellow female workers and mentors, discuss their challenges and understand their rights. Because as Dr. Uma said, it's not just about access to technologies, it's also about their rights. The program successfully concluded this month, reaching a total of 1,900 platform workers, and we're kind of proud of that. Further, um, the course for workers and other key stakeholders maximizing the potential of women in geek work contributes to addressing the social norms and hurdles women face when um, engaging in platform work. On the other hand, we aim at systemic and long-lasting change on the policy level. Therefore, we address policymakers and other key decision makers from private sector and civil society with tailored capacity development programs to challenge social norms towards more inclusive, agile, and sustainable regulation. So for this, the Gig Economy Initiative has designed a comprehensive digital course on the rise and economics of digital labor platforms. One of the main topics of the course is women in the gig economy. The focus of this module is to explore reasons for the hurdles women face and analyze the solutions to address these on a regulatory level. So this course was developed uh, together with leading professionals, including the World Bank, ILO, and Fair Work. And I've heard Dr. Umer that you're saying that sometimes international organizations are focusing too much on, on um, access to technology. So maybe we can discuss now um, in, in, in another um, half hour or so how, how you would say um, we should address uh, these different issues. The um, uh, the online, uh, the, uh, the, sorry, the course is accessible online for free and I invite you to join with us and to jointly promote gender sensitive and inclusive policies. So I'm very excited now uh, to listening to the, to the discussion and um, thank you all for uh, being here with us today. Thank you so much. No, Amy, for uh, that wonderful introduction. Um, we're gonna move on now to start thinking about what the report is saying itself. Um, so Anjali and I will start presenting some of the findings of the report. I can see that there's some questions coming through and I just wanna let all participants know on the call that uh, we're gonna have a Q&A section at the end of the event. Um, so, Please uh, hold on to hear your responses until then. Pablo, could we please have the slides? Amazing, thank you so much. So can we have uh, the first slide, please? Thank you so much. The interest for this report came from the fact that discussions on platform work and particularly location-based or what we call geographically tethered platform work have until recently tended to sideline gender quite a lot. In cities across the world, the archetype of the gig worker is often the ride hailing driver or the food delivery rider, a worker who is visible in the city with digital access and literacy, who's able to work at different times of day and comfortable navigating the city at those times of day. And of course, this worker is most often a man. So what we were thinking was, what about women and gender minorities? What does their platform work really look like? And what are the specific forms of marginality that they experience through this digitally mediated work? So in this report, we were able to extend our analysis to multiple countries and cities across the world by drawing on the expertise of the Fair Work Network. Next slide, please, Pablo. So what is the Fair Work research? Uh, you've heard a little bit about it, but our aim at Fair Work is to highlight the best and worst examples of how new technologies are being used in the workplace. In location-based platform work, we have five principles, fair pay, fair conditions, fair contracts, fair management, and fair representation that we use to assess the fairness of a platform to its workers. And we do this through a three-part methodology, through desk research, where we learn about platforms operations and we analyze worker contracts and terms and conditions, 
through worker interviews, where we interview around six to 10 workers per platform to learn about their working conditions. And then we also speak to platform managers to request evidence in relation to each one of the fair work, work principles. In addition to this, for this report, we also interviewed a number of researchers in the Fair Work Network to learn in more detail about the real nuances of gender and platform work. And I'll now, now hand over to Anjali to begin giving you a flavor of some of our report findings. Thank you. Uh, Pablo, next slide, please. Okay, I would like to direct you to the photograph on the screen. Now, this may appear to be the photo of a happy, relaxed worker at night by herself in an urban setting. Yet this image is an aspirational myth that fails to acknowledge that, such, that in such settings for women in the UK, that the platform that has this photograph on their website, Delibru, um, is based, do face discrimination. And it's actually quite uncommon for women to feel comfortable by themselves in such a setting. The point here is not to argue that women should not be employed because of stereotypes around what they can do and where they can be, but that platforms are just not acknowledging that their work can be particularly risky for women and gender minorities. Platforms assume that workers' sole aim is to maximize their short-term gains and that they can easily be incentivized to act in a predictable manner. This predictability in turn is at the heart of the platform economy's ability to access a large workforce of easily interchangeable individuals. Differences from the archetypical platform worker that Kavita described, whether it be in the form of gender, sexual orientation, or other social cultural characteristics, is for the most part ignored, leading to platforms that are effectively gender neutral. What this results in is a very disaggregated workforce. As Dr. Rani pointed out, and as the ILO has shown in a number of studies, we find that in the platform economy, women work mostly in private homes as beauticians, caregivers, cleaners, domestic work, while men work in public spaces as uh, ride hailing drivers and food couriers and gender minorities, frankly, are quite invisible. Next slide, please. So what is the experience of uh, women and gender minorities within the platform economy? So first of all, what I would like to point out is that many of these workers are highly precarious and vulnerable. We find that platform, the platform economy is particularly attractive to those uh, women and gender minorities who have care responsibilities, are stigmatized, do not have the right to work, and find that the lower barriers to platform economy allows them to obtain jobs. Now, what this looks like varies from cultural context to cultural context. For instance, in India, Bangladesh, and Egypt, we find that a lot of female platform workers are either divorced women or single mothers because these are identities that are stigmatized in that local context. On the other hand, in Belgium, we find that a lot of refugees have turned to platform economy because they don't have the right to work otherwise. What this means is that the precariousness that these workers face is intersectional. It's not just about the gender identity. It's also about their caste, their race, their religion, their legal status. But this is something, this nuance is something that's often missing in platforms, uh, anti-discrimination statements. We'll be talking more about the experiences of discrimination in the panel discussion. But for now, the point that I'm trying to make is that platforms are not neutral actors in the setting, that their policies can directly heighten workers' vulnerability. One key way in which this occurs through the lack of information that they provide to workers, particularly for women and gender minorities, is that they who often find themselves working in private homes and workplaces of their clients. Such workers are often in a constant state of fear and unease, unsure whose house they're going into, how they will be treated, and whether the client will be held to account if they abuse them. There's a lot platforms can do to mitigate this situation. For instance, platforms should require background checks and undertake identity verifications of clients 
just as they do for workers. They should also provide good, uh, accessible support channels that workers can use. I will now um, turn the presentation over to Kavita. Thank you. We see that gendered inequalities are amplified through platforms, technological operations and their infrastructures as well. For example, some platforms allow identity characteristics, including gender, to be displayed on the platform interface. And customers' social prejudices on gender as well as compounded by other characteristics can shape how they respond to seeing these identity characteristics. In some cases, customers can even choose workers after reviewing these characteristics. An example of this is in both Nigeria and in the Philippines, where we saw women experiencing frequent cancellations when customers realized that it's a woman ride hailing driver. Some male clients even ask women workers if they can drive instead. And this kind of gender discrimination rooted in the idea that women are bad drivers results in income loss due to either cancellations or workers not being chosen for jobs. In some cases, automated systems which favor clients mean that workers suffer the brunt of client complaints that can be rooted in discrimination. Earlier this year, I spoke to a beauty worker in the UK who said she faces frequent racism which sometimes leads to clients requesting refunds even months after a service is complete. This worker has no choice but to refund the money. In Paraguay, a worker was reported by a customer because their perceived gender identity didn't match the gender indicated through their name. And they were deactivated for two weeks by the platform while the platform resolved the issue, again, resulting in loss of earnings. Technological solutions which are often quick fixes, tend to reify gender divides, even when positioned as attempting to remedy them. In FairWorks research, we found numerous examples of platforms instituting technological solutions as safety measures. In India and in Indonesia, we see platforms putting in so-called so safety measures that either stopped women from working at particular times of the evening, or stopped them accessing certain forms of work. For example, delivery work involving carrying groceries, which were according to one platform too heavy for women, or ride hailing work, which according to another platform can involve long interaction times with cut clients and will therefore make women unsafe. And of course, again, this leads to lack of access to work, lack of earnings. Next slide, please. Digital labor platforms have often been touted as offering greater flexibility to workers, but the promises of drive when you want, make what you need, and doing work that fits around your life, which center time as the key component of flexible work, these promises really fall short when we examine worker experiences. I'm gonna give you two examples of the inflexibility of platform work in terms of timings for women workers. It's not clear on many platforms, whether cancelling jobs will lead to a high cancellation rate and will then determine how much a worker in the future is allocated work. While some platforms convey that workers won't be penalised for cancelling jobs, not being penalised doesn't necessarily mean that the cancellation rate metric won't affect future work allocation. In the US, women workers conveyed a feeling of inability to cancel jobs freely. And this was even to the extent of when some were in clearly unsafe situations. Second example, given that ratings are an inbuilt feature of many platforms, workers are keen to keep their ratings high, again, concerned that it will affect future access to work. We found across contexts particularly for feminized and home-based platform work, that women workers would carry out either unpaid work or extra work, which wasn't included in the platform service in order to keep clients happy. Whether that be going to fulfill a massage service for a client and then being asked to stay and do the cooking or clients radically underestimating the sizes of their homes for cleaning work and then a worker having to stay extra time to do that job. Back to you, Anjali. 
Thank you. Next slide, please. Okay. So at Fair Work, we do not believe that the unfair situations women and gender minorities find themselves are in any way inevitable. Using Fair Work's five principles, we've developed five recommendations for platforms. So our first recommendation is around fair pay. And we think we believe that platforms should pay all workers a living wage after costs and ensure consistent earnings amongst them. Commonplace platform practices such as dynamic pricing um, disproportionately favor male workers. We find over and over again that women workers particularly are not able to work at night after dark because of issues around care responsibilities, because of issues around safety. And this effectively means that, that there's a gender pay gap with their male colleagues earning more than them. We also find, as Kavita um, explained, that industries, feminized industries tend to have high degrees of unpaid work, which again disproportionately favors, um, disproportionately disfavors women. Um, furthermore, by not having a living wage, it basically is forcing workers to work overtime. And we do find commonly that workers are working 80 to 90 hours. Now, this is just in a week. Now, this is just not possible for those women and gender minorities who have care responsibilities. And it effectively leaves them out of this economy. Secondly, when it comes to fair conditions, we do believe that platforms need to prioritize workers' safety and access to benefits like parental leave, sick pay, and insurance. Thirdly, when it comes to contracts, workers need to prioritize worker safety in data collection and sharing information through their user interfaces. Again, this is disproportionately benefits women and gender minorities. Platforms will often share data like GPS information uh, with customers, and this allows for workers to be stalked. It allows for customers to reject um, a worker based on their gender identity, as in the example of the worker in Paraguay and it leads to lost earnings and a high degree of trauma. Thirdly, in, when it comes to management, fourthly, sorry, when it comes to management, uh, platforms should implement meaningful anti-discrimination policies as well as mechanisms for readily seeking worker feedback. We have unfortunately found in Fairbanks research that very few platforms can evidence a, a meaningful anti-discrimination statement. And finally, when it comes to representation, platforms really do need to enable interactions amongst women and gender minorities, and they ought to collaborate with existing women and gender minority-led collectives, associations, and trade unions. This is a crucial opportunity for platforms to gain further insight into how um, conditions can be employed for these workers. Next slide, please. Similarly, we've developed some recommendations for policymakers around the world. We really believe that policymakers should require platforms to share gender disaggregated data. They should make platforms liable for accident reporting and provide adequate safety gear. And they should grant platform workers access to existing worker tribunals and legal mechanisms. Moreover, they should consult women and gender minorities, worker collectives, associations, and trade unions in platform-related uh, regulation. Moving down to consumers, we believe that consumers have a unique ability to pressure platforms to provide for and treat their workers more fairly. We, believe, um, we strongly encourage institutional consumers to sign the Fair Work Pledge. We recommend that individual consumers consult Fair Work's country ratings and keep up with new publications and announcement. There's nothing inevitable about poor working conditions or entrenched gender inequalities in the platform economy. However, the inconsiderate and unregulated growth of platform work risks undoing decades of work on improving worker participation and narrowing the gender pay gap. The fair work methodology insists that fair, conditions, fair working conditions can and are achievable for all workers, regardless of their gender identity. And with that, next slide, please, Pablo. Um, I'd like to thank you all. And next slide, please. This is a list of all the fair work people. Yes, and I think we can move on to the panel discussion. Thanks so much, Anjali. Um, I'm going to ask uh, the panelists 
to please turn on your cameras. So that's Cheryl, Janaki, and Tanya. Thank you so much. We're lucky to be joined by three members of our Fair Work Network who also provided detailed insights uh, to us, which fed into the report and feature in the Gender and Platform Work report. We'd first like to welcome Janaki Srinivasan, who is a co-investigator for the Fair Work Project in India. She's also an assistant professor at the International Institute of Information Technology, Bangalore, IIIT Bangalore. Her research examines the politics of information technology-based development, and her work has shown how gender, class, and caste shape Indian digital inclusion initiatives. For the Fair Work Project, Janaki is involved with developing and implementing the research and fieldwork strategies in India. We'd like to... Welcome Tanya Jakobi, the Principal Investigator for Fair Work in Serbia. She's also the Executive Director of the Public Policy Research Center. Her research interests are focused on labor markets, discrimination at work and precaritization. She's also interested in the impact of new technologies on labor contracts and unionization. For the Fair Work Project in Serbia, she oversees local research activities and contributes towards publications emanating from the research. And finally, we'd like to welcome Cheryl Soriano, the Principal Investigator for Fair Work Philippines. Cheryl, uh, sorry, Cheryl's research focuses on the implications of digital media on social and organizational practices and formations. For the Fair Work Project, she's set to expand her research to examine, using the Fair Work principles, the design and labor arrangements facilitated by emerging labor platforms in the Philippines. She will examine how digital labor is becoming embedded within the larger technological, cultural, and social experience of Filipino workers and their communities. Thank you so much for being here with us today, Janaki, Tanya, and Cheryl. What I'm really struck by in all of your research, which kind of resonates a lot with the two keynotes that we heard earlier, is the focus on the social and the cultural aspects of technologies, the idea that technology is not just a neutral thing, but is itself social and cultural and has social and cultural effects as well. And the way that we kind of try and grapple with this in the gender report is really to highlight the interplay between platforms themselves, the ways in which they operate, their infrastructures, how they're positioned by platform companies, and how they're used by customers, and then how all of this comes to affect workers in different ways. So building on this, I'd like to ask each of you a question from your own context in relation to gender and platform work. So first of all, Tanya, from the context of Serbia, how do the platforms make their work accessible to women and gender minorities? And do you think they kind of fall short or they succeed in making platform work? accessible well thank you for the question i would first like to congratulate you again uh, this report is excellently written and enormously important as it addresses topics that were previously absent from the public sphere and i'm pleased that we had the opportunity to learn from the draft report at the cost conference in belgrade two weeks ago where we discussed almost the same question but with uh, more focus on uh, people with disabilities, long-term unemployed workers, and migrants. Uh, to answer your question, I would say that platforms engaged in food delivery in Serbia are open to women and gender minorities, and in the case of cleaners, to men as well. However, being open does not necessarily mean being accessible. Let me first address their openness. The Serbian labor market is characterized by high barriers for vulnerable groups, including women, youth, long-term unemployed individuals, people with disabilities, and others. In this context, all labor platforms act as an open window of opportunity. The reason platforms embrace workers from all backgrounds is simple. Serbia is experiencing a short shortage of labor force and it lacks a significant mi migrant labor population. Therefore, platforms are more than willing to accept anyone interested in working according to their rules. Some food delivery platforms actively promote platform work to female workers, while platforms engaged in cleaning work welcome men. However, the numbers of female workers on food delivery platforms 
and male workers in the in the, uh, platforms offering clinic services are negligible. The percentage of female workers in food delivery platforms is approximately 10%, while we do not have specific data for platforms offering cleaning jobs. There are several reasons why women are underrepresented on food delivery platforms. The nature of the work is physically demanding, and as mentioned in your report, dynamic pricing tenders to favor men. Platforms often better pay to couriers who can handle heavier packages, resulting in women missing out on bonuses. Furthermore, traffic in Serbia can be hectic, and the numbers of bicycle-related facilities is relatively high. Consequently, women often choose to use cars for delivery, which often leads to lower earnings since those using bicycles tend to earn more. Although not widespread, women couriers uh, shared in interviews conducted in June that they sometimes face discrimination from consumers or encounter unwanted comments. While Serbia is generally a safe country without dangerous urban areas, some women engaged in food delivery expressed concerns about personal safety and desired more support from the platform in such cases. On the other hand, men willing to engage in cleaning jobs encountered prejudices from consumers who believe this type of work is reserved for women. In summary, workers on platforms in Serbia face both deep-rooted societal prejudices and amplified challenges on platforms, despite fair pay being offered. However, to be fair, platforms are taking some steps to become more accessible and equitable places. Our experience suggests that some of the small platforms led by women were open to improve their practices. They check customer IDs and they offer their workers the ability to decline work if the person on the spot is not the one who negotiated the job or the job description doesn't match with the real situation. So both workers and clients are engaged in choosing each other and rating each other. In cooperation with the Fair Work Team Serbia, their policies with regard to safety at work and human support throughout the workday uh, which is often taking place in the afternoon, improved. Additionally, some other larger platforms have made slight improvements by providing opportunities for workers to report discrimination. Uh, still, I would stop here and then we can discuss uh, further improvements later on because these are just small step steps and uh, uh, issues you refer to are much larger ones. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tanya. I think um, one of the things that really strikes me um, as significant when you're talking is, you know, the really low numbers of, of women workers in food delivery um, and how that is kind of contrasted with what we see in platforms PR campaigns as well. Um, thinking back to Dr. Rani's keynote as well, it's really um, it's really something the kind of visuals that we see from the platforms versus what's actually happening in reality in a lot of the world, but as you say, in Serbia. Another thing that um, I want to focus on here is uh, in our report, we talk about uh, technological solutions to solving problems of gender segregation or discrimination. And Cheryl, I wanted to ask you in the context of Philippines, uh, what examples do you see of technological solutions and do they work? What are their limits if, if they don't work? <laughs> All right. Um, thank you, Kavita and Anjali. And again, congratulations to uh, the authors. Um, there's not a lot <laughs> of, of very um, inspirational advances in the context of location-based platforms, but I can name a few from the context of cloud work platforms that are more um, women, uh, specifically women-focused, that perhaps we can draw from. So. First is, um, I'll, I'll probably give three examples. First in the context of false flexibility, right? So um, we can assume that women, uh, um, people can choose, workers can choose whatever time they would like to go out. But essentially in reality, as, as you mentioned, um, they could be um, penalized in terms of, uh, in the on the basis of when incentive structures are coordinated around how many gigs you perform within certain hours, within a day, for example. And so uh, one particular um, cloud work platform um, that's designed to center women's needs of flexibility, for example, care work, factors in women's preferences and tries to factor in and, and promote that in the platform so that it attracts particular kinds of people who will be willing to, clients, for example, who will be willing to accommodate those preferences of women. 
And when that is in the forefront, in the center of, of how they promote themselves as, as, as real and authentically um, um, considering the, the specific conditions of women and women's needs to be flexible, then th that, th that does is considered and not penalized when, when they account for incentives, when they account for ratings, when they account for cancellations. I guess the second one is when, um, so again, in the context of, so I guess no, even my example for cloud work, that can also apply in the context of geographically tethered work. Another example is where in cloud work, um, women may tend to, for example, underplay their skills. So for example, if they've left work for a while because they've had to like give birth, they might underplay their skills, but in fact, they may be very experienced. So if you would think about this in the context of um, um, geographically tethered work, if a woman has children, and I, and I know this because I've, I've, I've interviewed a woman, she says initially, I'm not even sure if I should admit that I have children. Well, I know it's, she knows it's flexible, but she's not sure if she admits her entire con entirety of her condition, if she will be um, relegated to a disadvantaged position in comparison to the many other competitors in the industry. So what I'm saying here is that do platforms in the level, for example, of access, are, are, are these considered and even encouraged by platforms and, and consider the realities of women who may have children and that they do uh, accommodate these realities. And I guess the third one is in relation to safety. I believe Noemi also mentioned this in, in the keynote that um, there may be, a, platforms will have embedded in their design emergency buttons. Are emergency buttons responsive? But also our workers, um, our workers, specifically women, trained to think of what might be the consequence when they actually report. So in my, in my conversations with men, women workers, they will say, but I'm afraid I might get deactivated. If I do a lot of cancellations on the basis of maybe fear, if I go out at night and I kind of suspect the, 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 the client or I kind of fear my condition, if I do cancel a lot, I know I will be penalized. So what are the accompanying consequences? You may have emergency buttons, but what are the, what are the, um, uh, the, the rest of the conditions that, that actually do encourage women to use these emergency buttons and report for example, harassment condition. So I guess I'll, I'll stop there for a while. There may be several more like um, considerations of welfare, um, et cetera, but those are kind of in the periphery of, of technological solutions that are also quite crucial um, um, for women workers. Thank you, Cheryl. And I'm, I'm nodding as you speak because um, you know, when we were writing this report, we saw so many similar instances of women being actually discouraged to use inbuilt features of platforms because of the lack of transparency, the lack of knowledge around how it will then affect them in the future. Um, I just want to bring in my colleague Anjali here to, um, to request if you have any examples of those, um, those instances where women are kind of discouraged to uh, use platform features. Thank you. Um, so examples of instances where women are discouraged to use platform features. I think the I think maybe uh, the most stark one is one that you had mentioned in the presentation where platforms are the platforms just unilaterally ban women from accessing certain types of work. But there's also um, more of a more of a softer but more invasive uh, form of discouragement. So for instance, if workers complain, um, for instance, in Egypt, if workers complained, there's always this feeling, even though they had the right to complain, there was always this concern that if we complain, we'll get less jobs. And there wasn't uh, any clarity on whether it was going to affect their ratings, if it was going to lower their KPIs, uh, their key performance indicators, and lead to fewer jobs and lower payments. So things like that are ways in which platforms also effectively silence uh, women and gender minorities. Another thing that we commonly occur mm -hmm. is just the support chat function. For many platforms, it is an automated chat system. Mm -hmm. And you're unlikely to report mm -hmm. an instance of sexual harassment, for instance, to a mm -hmm. thing that's giving you automated responses. So all of these things work to basically 
send the message that the platform isn't particularly interested in what the worker is going through, just that they do the job. Thanks, Anjali. And I think what you're really speaking to here is, you know, the the unresponsiveness of platforms, both listen to workers, but also respond in a meaningful way. I think these technological solutions are often so um, quick fix like that they don't end up in anything meaningful, rather they just serve as a mechanism, a mechanism that platforms can demonstrate to show that they're doing something, but in reality, it looks quite different. And it also kind of signifies the inflexibility of platforms to actually respond to what workers want. So that takes me to my next question for you, Janaki. Um, and I'm really thinking about um, the Fair Work India team's work on, on flexibility. I know it was a big section in uh, last year's report. Platforms make claims of flexible work for all workers, especially when they target women workers. But in relation to gender and platform work, what does flexibility really mean in practice in the Indian context? Uh, thanks, Kavita, and congratulations to all of you for the report, which I think is just so important because I think all of us recognize how important a dimension gender is and how uh, platform work looks different for women and other uh, gender minorities. But I think we hadn't actually gotten around to collating all the fantastic work we have from uh, different countries in our network. So really uh, thankful for this opportunity. But at the same time, uh, I'm performing the unenviable task of being the last panelist after many wonderful things have been said already about flexibility, but I'll, I'll try and see if I can uh, say something, uh, uh, add something to that. So I think uh, it's also worthwhile stepping back a little bit to say, and you pointed to the Fair Work India report. And of course, one of the reasons we picked up on flexibility as our key theme for 2022 is that a much touted um, uh, report by the Niti Aayog uh, uh, in India in 2022 highlighted flexibility as one of the key features um, of the gig uh, economy and also highlighted how it would be of benefit to women in particular, just, just like you were pointing out, but there's actually one specific document that gets into it in detail, right? That's the reason we did it. But what we have been finding in countries around, including in India, is that, of course, uh, uh, it's not flexible in practice for anyone, but that said, who you are. Right. What kinds of resources you have access to, what kinds of social networks you have access to, what assumptions people make about you and your skill levels because of your social location, what stigmas attached to you and the work you do. All of this fundamentally shapes how flexibility works for individual workers. Right. And of course, gender in conjunction with the workers, caste, religion, region, race is a key part of all of this. And that's really why um, uh, we are bringing up these two things in conjunction. Um, and I thought I would look at it from sort of uh, uh, three ways. Uh, one is, um, ironically, despite platforms talking so much about flexibility, like you pointed out, whether it is through their priorities, their rules, or the kind of initiatives that they um, uh, originate, uh, it doesn't, flexibility isn't the term that comes to mind, right? So for instance, despite the fact that uh, platforms um, are touted as being flexible, et cetera, and that is like uh, Uma pointed out, one of the reasons that women come to these platforms, um, we saw again and again, uh, I have like a ton of examples here, I won't really get into them, but uh, grocery delivery uh, service, for instance, uh, this woman says that she has a kid, uh, she's had to take leave uh, for a variety of reasons kid, uh, related to the kid's education or if he's sick, etc. But if she takes more than two leaves in a month, she's been penalized in various ways, right? So uh, worth thinking about where the flexibility is here. Um, uh, again, someone else pointed out how she could have been promoted to a higher end of a beauty service if only she could put in more hours, uh, front more upfront costs, etc. So again, you have to ask what the constraints are. Uh, now, in addition to this, another reason you can't just pick up and uh, uh, sort of uh, get into newer schemes or um, uh, work on particular uh, incentive schemes that are just uh, rolled out, uh, like, you know, with a week's notification or whatever, is that 
uh, they have a bunch of others that they also depend on for getting some of their work done. So for instance, we found again and again that uh, uh, women uh, might uh, use money from uh, especially their husbands to front some of their upfront costs and uh, say if you're a beauty worker, for instance. Or uh, there was also this uh, case we found where women who were driving electric vehicles, for instance, uh, because platforms don't necessarily train them on how to change batteries, they would depend on their husbands to do this, which meant that uh, because their husbands were not on the job with them, they would spend a lot of time standing in queues, which male workers didn't really do because they would just go swap out the battery at home. So there are a bunch of examples like this which show you how gendered this is. Um, and of course, people pointed out safety concerns. One thing I wanted to point out here is also safety also operates at two levels. One is, of course, uh, the safety concerns that you yourself think of when you go out into the world. But as a woman, you also have to contend with what uh, perceptions people have of what is unsafe for you. Right? So that operates almost at two levels. And uh, uh, we had these examples about uh, uh, from this woman working on a grocery service uh, who basically said that, you know, we had a lot of incentives around festivals, including the festival of Holi uh, in India. And uh, for anyone who uh, understands the Indian context, this also tends to be uh, a festival where uh, uh, women end up getting really mistreated, harassed in the name of the festival. So women themselves might be concerned about going out, but they realize that um, uh, it's going to give them incentives. So they might want to go out, um, even though they're not very happy about it. But on top of that, they also have family who tells them, well, don't go out on that day. So they also have to deal with that. Uh, so there are a bunch more examples like this around platform rules. Um, of course, then there's also the question of interaction with customers. And I think uh, there's many of you brought up, which is that given the nature of the relationship between workers and the platform management, and their lack of trust that the management will rise to their help rather than um, side with the customers means, uh, and that coupled with the fact that ratings from customers are really, really opaque, so they don't actually know how they function. In light of all this, it feels like fiction to expect workers to come up with complaints against customers, many of which we encountered, right? It could be uh, and discrimination, as we know, is a spectrum. So it could be from an innocuous remark around, oh, I didn't expect a woman to show up at my door to things that are uh, much more uh, hurtful and impactful uh, for the women. But even with that, uh, the fact that they think twice about taking it to the customer uh, service of the platform is very, very telling, right? And that's what we encountered again and again. And finally, I think it's also worth pointing out that uh, it's not like women get a lot of support from their own colleagues, most of whom tend to be men. Right? And uh, again and again, you see quotes around uh, women basically being told that, uh, well, if you can't handle this, you should have just sat at home, right? Uh, and way more uh, egregious things. So I think all of these relationships of women with, uh, of course, their family and the societal structures uh, they're embedded in, uh, but particularly with platform management and the rules uh, with their own colleagues, as well as customers, all of these then make this actually quite an inflexible uh, environment for women to operate in. Thank you, Janaki, for that very rich um, analysis and so many voices of, of workers that we heard from through you, uh, which really gives us an idea of this kind of gray zone of discrimination uh, that workers experience from everything from, you know, co offhand comments here and there to much more, um, much more impactful and um, effective uh, forms of discrimination, which have, you know, these long-term effects on workers. I want to open up to uh, questions now, and I'm going to ask uh, the two keynote speakers to please also join us for the Q&A, because I can also see some questions uh, directed at you both as well. Um, I'm going to try and pull out some of the questions uh, of topics that we haven't yet covered yet. And I'm going to start with this one question. Um, which is a question to Dr. Rani from Toma Gadi that says, can you give an example of how the way algorithms works causes gender inequalities? Over to you, Dr. Rani. Thanks a lot. I was hoping that this question would come 
And I'm very glad to see that. Actually, it happens in many ways. And uh, to an extent, some of the panelists have actually also mentioned it in their interventions. But I'm going to tell you how it happens with algorithms and how it also happens without algorithms. Let me start by the latter, because that's the far easiest one. So, you know, uh, in the traditional labor market, we've always talked about discrimination and inequalities per se, but it has always been very, very difficult to, pure, uh, to prove uh, because, you know, you do a number of these econometric exercises and you do controls and everything. And then you try to say whether this is pure discrimination or not. But on platforms, it's far more easier where we do find that even on the freelance platforms, it's super interesting to see how with the platform design, actually, you can very clearly go about deciding whether you want a woman worker to actually do this particular task or not. And you can also decide whether you want workers from certain geographies to actually do this kind of a work or not. So on one of the major uh, freelance platforms, we had one of the women responding in the qualitative responses saying that uh, she had a main client imply that a certain task was beyond her head because she was a woman. So because of that, she, she would not really get the task. While on location-based platforms, actually the way it works is through the rating system, which has been mentioned before, because if you have a lower rating system, especially in male dominated occupations that are there, you're very clearly doubly disadvantaged as a result of it. Now, what happens within that is that, you know, if you're looking at, and this is something we found in Argentina very clearly, in, in taxi driving, which is largely male dominated sector in most of the world. And when women are entering that particular sector, you know, the penalization happens through the entire uh, dynamic search pricing system, because you have this dynamic search pricing system coming up and operating during the evenings, nights and weekends. And they do provide these bonuses and benefits and all of that. Now that very cl clearly in some sense discriminates women workers because this is not something directly available to them. The other thing that happens with it is largely that when men accept that, you lead to increasing your ratings as a result of it because you're accepting. And if the women were there and she were to cancel that, there is a penalization that happens, right? Because she cannot really go about taking it because of, uh, women's care responsibilities that are there. And sometimes it's also interesting that depending upon who is getting the job, even the kind of pricing mechanisms that are there, they undergo a change. So, you know, you think it's all algorithms, but there are humans also behind those algorithms on a regular basis, trying to actually manipulate and change it. So you very clearly see that happening on taxi platforms, you have, see that happening on delivery platforms, you see that happening on freelance platforms on a regular basis. Like even geographical discrimination is something we have uh, documented in a very systematic manner where you can find that happening. Thanks. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Rani. Um, one of the I'm going to I'm pulling out a few questions um, and I'm going to try and merge them into one. I know there's a question on um, the regulation of the platform economy by Lucy Susova. And there's also the first question by uh, Shefali Mehra on um, the role of stakeholders beyond platforms in enabling fairness and enabling fair working conditions in the platform economy. So both of these questions kind of speaking a little bit to the idea of stakeholders beyond platforms and also um, what can we do outside of platforms in terms of regulation. Um, and I was hoping, Noemi, you could tell us a little bit in relation to this uh, about BMZ's work and how you are encouraging um, fairness in the platform economy through your initiatives. One of the things that I was struck by that you said earlier was, you know, we need initiatives that are really shaped by women. We need 
digital development initiatives that are not kind of top down, but really have uh, the people who are experiencing these initiatives at front and center. So over to you. Yes, thank you very much. I mean, what we do is that um, we shape uh, capacity uh, development programs that are tailor made. And in this, um, we discuss with uh, the women themselves and those that, that are um, actually impacted to see how we can support them. Um, I mentioned the courses that we offer that are on, available online um, so that they can um, have an access tailor-made because, I mean, context is very important um, and there is not one size fits all um, initiative. And while doing these programs, uh, we discuss, of course, and, and see with the women and continued to shape them together. So this is something um, that this gig economy um, initiative is, is working on um, uh, at, at the level of the workers themselves and also uh, showing them the, the, the rights and explaining to them what they can do from, 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 from our experts uh, point of view. Um, in terms of regulation, um, I've, I've seen the question, thank you very much. It's, it's a very, it's not an easy one because um, from a development corporation perspective, we, we do welcome international standards and frameworks. Um, and the minister has, has, has also stated that. Um, so harmonizing a fragmented regulation on a regional and global level is, is an important step um, at ensuring that platforms um, do not exploit a regulatory uh, loopholes, for example. Um, in order to pay a workers a lower wage in a neighboring country, etc. Um, so um, th this is not not very important. This is not very easy to do um, to, to to address, you know, with a common uh, language. So we're looking at that um, also um, at the federal government level, and of course the the, the devil is in the detail then uh, when looking at regulation. But of course, in general, fair regulation is one of the priority topics that, that um, uh, we also address, uh, as you can see in the digital agenda that uh, my government and, and BFZ is, is actively also shaping. Thank you so much, Noemi. I can see that we are fast running out of time, but I really want to ask one final question to the panel, because what we haven't heard about yet is uh, anything about really about worker organizations and trade unions. So I want to give a little bit of time to that for the final question. Um, so I'll ask uh, Tanya, Cheryl and Yaniki a question from Joe Buckley, which is what are the implications of your analysis for trade unions, organizing and campaigning strategies? What recommendations would you give uh, for trade unions? Thinking about this uh, in terms of gender and platform work. Um, shall I hand over to you, Tanya, first? Thank you. Well, uh, if I say that we, since uh, this year, didn't have any unrest by platform workers, I think I said almost enough, even though we are working with uh, unions and workers to <laughs> hope to, you know, like to, to incentivize them to think about this type of uh, engagement. They are not engaged in that way because uh, uh, even the full time contract legal contracts we have in Serbia are not of good quality. So therefore they have no incentive or, or have little incentive to, you know, like to organize and look for more rights in that respect. And second, uh, I will now turn to maybe a little bit of different avenue of thinking, saying that we, for example, believe that the Commissioner for Equality and the Commissioner for uh, data privacy are two, uh, also two important stakeholders to be, you know, like uh, introduced to this topic, at least in Serbia, because we think that they are much more flexible and open to uh, new realities and to uh, their work in within and, uh, you know, like uh, in uh, improving uh, whatever they can in their uh, scope of work. Thank you. Thank you, Tanya. Um, and I'll hand over to you, Cheryl, next. Right. Um, so I think in the Philippines, even uh, your large worker associations might not exactly be very well sensitized about the reality of, of, of 
of gender minorities in relation to platform work. And I think conversations like this is so crucial to pay attention and to also center the, the conditions of gender minorities in relation to this work. Um, when we think about platforms, we also imagine what people think when they design platforms and how they think about interventions. And they imagine a particular group of people dominating that, normally men, normally young men, right? And so we need to uh, kind of uh, shake that by inserting these kinds of conversations. And I guess the second one is that I have started to see in our research um, some mutual aid associations led by women. I, I mentioned this uh, in, in our interviews with you. And these are very inspiring where women, because of platforms not being very responsive or taking them upon themselves to kind of come up with interventions where they can um, say, come up with uh, ways to make platform or gig work better for them. And I think unions should be paying attention to these uh, because it, it, uh, it, it is from the seed of these organizations stemming from general minorities and organizing themselves as collectives that can be perhaps bridged into larger forms of work organizations. Thank you, Cheryl. Now over to you, Janaki. Yeah, that's a very interesting question. And I think uh, much like Cheryl in India as well, uh, uh, this is not necessarily a question that unions are taking on front and center. That said, uh, there have been strikes led by women uh, in the beauty sector, especially in the last couple of years, which have received support uh, from unions, which have been more taxi drivers, food delivery, and which have been largely male. So I think that's a good step. Uh, I think one thing uh, uh, to keep in mind here is that because of the nature of how gig workers structure, the lack of platform support, et cetera, workers tend to depend a lot on each other to even understand and make sense of some of the kind of opacities we have talked about. And this is something that women, again, lose out on because they don't have enough other women they can hang out with. They don't necessarily feel welcome by their uh, male colleagues. And also because the same time constraints that don't allow them to take up certain job opportunities also don't give them the time to network, right? Uh, and I think making all of this central to the conversation that unions are having and how being inclusive is something that is going to deliver benefits for everyone involved is something that really needs to start in the Indian context. But I think the support that some of these unions have been lending to some of the strikes that women have had means that they too can see common cause, right? Some of the problems are similar. So I think there's a beginning, but I think there's a, a long, long road to go. Thank you, Janaki and Uma, I can see you have your hand up as well. I'll hand over to you. If you don't mind. I know we are up on time. I just want to say one thing when you're talking about the unions. You know, India, it's not just India, but a number of developing countries have historically and, uh, you know, there's a, uh, there's a very um, concerted effort towards organizing workers in the informal economy. So, you know, there are these excellent examples that exist from organizing home-based peace rate workers in the BD or tobacco industry to a whole range of other informal sectors. So, you know, that kind of uh, informal sector organizing is something that the rest of the world can actually learn from. And you see very much being there as part of the gig economy struggles and unionizing. I think a very recent paper that Leeds University has done for the ILO actually brings out that about more than 80 or 90% of the strikes are actually initiated by informal worker associations. And in the context of India, what we have seen with the kind of uh, different sectoral work that we have been doing is, even there is, you know, even if you talk about women being part of the marginalized group, it's very interesting to see in the case of the beauty workers, how women have got together and also navigated the algorithm on the platforms using just simple tools like WhatsApp. So for me, that's the beginning of a very good story to say that women can get together and actually coordinate uh, 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 the individual resistance to much more uh, collective resistance and collective action as we move forward in this fight for decent working conditions on platforms. Thank you so much. 
Thank you, Dr. Rani. I think that's such a great point to finish on is like really highlighting the creative workarounds that workers take up and use to navigate this fairly complicated space. Um, and I think that's really important to, to highlight, to really indicate worker agency here as well. I want to apologize that I've kept you uh, seven minutes past the indicated time and uh, apologies that we uh, didn't get to answer all of the questions as well. I would love that to keep this conversation going, but please do engage with all of our future events. Um, earlier, Cheryl was talking about cloud work. We've actually got our Fair Work cloud work launch happening on the 20th of July. So please do tune into that. Three big takeaways from this conversation I just want to highlight is that the design of platform matters, who we're thinking about when we think about the platform worker and how the platform is designed around that particular worker matters and is gendered. Second point, platforms exist in already existing labor markets, right? So the gender discrepancies that we already see in those labor markets are transferred into platform work and sometimes amplified by platforms functionalities. And the final thing is that workers need to be front and center in their involvement in their conversations with platforms. This is really crucial for platforms changing uh, their practices in favor of workers. Thank you so much to all of our panelists for joining us, uh, Janaki Srinivasan, Tanya Yakabi, Cheryl Soriano, and our two keynotes, Dr. Uma Rani, no Noemi Burkle. Uh, thank you so much to my co-author, Anjali Krishan, and to our Fair Work tech support, um, who you can't see, but is my colleague, Pablo, who's been working hard behind the scenes to enable this event to happen. Thank you and see you all very soon. Goodbye. Bye. Thank you.